Okay, so welcome back to Mobile Communications, Chapter 4, Wireless Telecommunication Systems. And today in the Q&A session, I will mainly cover security, the big topic in wireless communication security, a bit higher data rates and a very special system used for authorities, fleet management, etc. called Tetra. So let's begin with security. Only three slides because, well, you could, I guess, endlessly discuss uh, security issues. And this is just to give you a brief insight into some of the technologies used here. I explained a bit around the algorithms and the authentication scheme, the idea of a challenge response scheme with a random number, a secret key ki this is the individual secret authentication key stored in the authentication center in the network and stored in the sim and if nothing goes wrong no one should know this secret key well besides the sim module and the authentication center and that's it so we had here the authentication and uh, we had the key generation encryption of the data stream which is not a strong encryption but at least an encryption that helps to protect the data over the wireless link so that was the idea okay and uh, this is what i mean you have to remember this is early 80s early 90s then when the system was introduced so this key was considered as relatively strong at these times, it was too strong for certain services, secret services. So the key was weakened by uh, actually setting 10 bits to zero. So this makes the key even weaker. So it's not a strong encryption, whatever system. OK, that is the, the basic idea. But how, uh, as I also told you, you can change. You can change the algorithms. Okay, the first question from your side, which encryption algorithm is applied in most cases? So the point is uh, you have the three algorithms called A3, you have the A8 and the A5. And as I explained, you can use for A3 and A8 whatever you like, more or less. That means as a network operator, you could use a different algorithm. That's indeed what the companies do. Uh, as long as the key and the algorithm in your authentication center matches the key and the algorithm in the SIM, everything is fine. So if you are a network operator and say, I want to have a really, really, really strong encryption scheme, and there are several schemes in the literature, well, you can do this. You only need the SIM and you hand out SIMs that are able to perform certain algorithms. And you can have these algorithms also in your authentication center. Then you could do more or less whatever you want to do. However, A5, that's inside the mobile station. You cannot simply replace the A5s. There are several versions of uh, algorithms known. So, uh, yes. There are different versions and the operators, network operators, and also the devices, they can pick different algorithms, but uh, you cannot simply replace the, the algorithms inside uh, the device. That's, that's a problem. So in the end today, you do not have a single A5, but you have an A5 version one from I think late 80s and a very simple one and you could attack this uh, and then there's a, an advanced version a5 version 2 a5 version 3 version 4 so uh, today uh, the algorithm uses uh, that's I think the version 4 uses 128 bit so that's a longer key and uh, in GPS it has a different name. But so that's the basic uh, idea is uh, that you can use different algorithms. However, 
for most of the algorithms used the A5s, there are different attack schemes known. So this is not really a, a very strong thing. But remember, if you change the A5 algorithm, that means you have to replace the algorithms also in the base stations. So uh, that's the that's the point. So um, well, so if you, uh, for example, the changing to A5 version three required for the German telecom tens of thousands of base stations to get an update and also the devices uh well the devices have to know this so you have to talk to the device manufacturers you have to uh, replace the algorithms in the base station so that's a lot of work and in the end still it's not a strong encryption scheme so it's way simpler to replace the a3 and the a8 but remember it's n no one uh, well plan to have a strong encryption there because inside the network the data is unencrypted anyhow so I mean why having extremely strong encryption on the wireless link if you do not protect the data in the on the wired part inside the infrastructure so it's only here for this wireless link that's all but so if you look up uh, Wikipedia or literature or whatever you will find different versions of the algorithms. So this is why I explained the basic principle. Yes, and today you can use longer keys and stronger algorithms, but still they are not as strong as you could do it. So not uh, advanced encryption standard with 256 uh, bit keys or whatever. Okay, so the algorithm today used today is this uh, A5 version version 4. I think this is uh, quite common also in GPRS. Uh, the packet uh, service uses this version 4. And I think they changed this uh, roughly seven, seven, eight years ago. They changed from weaker algorithms to a bit stronger algorithms. But you see this was introduced or uh, standardized uh, in the mid 80s, introduced in the early 90s. So a lot of development done there. Okay, so, well, we, we basically covered the questions and I will also come back to one of the questions you asked the last times. So, first of all, let's quickly go through uh, this. You have to know, basically, or should know what is protected by the system and what is missing. And, uh, okay, I think I ex just explained it. Uh, I explained at least during the data transmission, but what else is protected? So at least something is protected that is quite valuable for the network operators. So what do the algorithms in the end at least protect? So we had the wireless link already, but what else is protected? Just type in all the answers. Authentication of the user against the SIM. Yes, this is done via the PIN. The PIN could be way stronger. So it could be more than four digits. But okay, you have to keep it simple in a way that users remember. Because if you, uh, well, enter the wrong number several times, the SIM will be blocked and you need the pin unlocking key and usually if you're traveling you don't have it and then you cannot use your mobile phone anymore and this is why this pin is usually a simple four digit pin you could make it uh, more complex but even today you know if you uh, boot your mobile phone the phone asks for the simple pin so usually it's things like face recognition whatever this is not used for it well you could but not that the SIM simply, uh, the module itself accepts this PIN. So that's one thing. And that's important that, I mean, because compared to other uh, fixed telephones, it's quite simple to steal a mobile phone. So that's, 
the idea. Then the a challenge response between SIM and operator, that's absolutely true. So the point is the network operator wants to make sure that no whatever malicious device or a non-authenticated device is allowed to participate in the mobile phone system. And the idea behind this is basically that I will trust the network because I am the network as an operator, but I cannot trust all the devices. I don't know. Uh, many, many years ago, it was even not allowed to use your own fixed phone on the telephone network. So you had to get a phone from the monopoly, whatever the government or who else run the phone system. And so it was quite similar with mobile phones. Uh, but the idea of SIM and detaching the SIM from the device now allows for, well, uh, many different devices, but at least you want to make sure that no matter what the device is, there is someone paying for whatever service is used. And this is why you have to authenticate at least the SIM against the network that you know, okay, this is a certain subscriber. Whoever is using the mobile phone right now, but someone will pay for it. There is indeed, as you write, uh, you could use a challenge response scheme or whatever schemes, uh, enhanced schemes also for the authentication of the network. This is not implemented in the classical GSM system. So you don't know. In today's, the newer systems, this is implemented. Because um, no one actually uh, thought of, well, someone can fake a base station because you need a lot of computing power. Well, mid 80s and even the 90s, it was not possible. But uh, then as soon as we had software defined radios, uh, it was also possible to fake base stations. That means you could simply fake a certain network operator. And if you have a fake base station with a strong signal, well, the mobile phones will try to attach themselves to this faked base station. You can even switch off the encryption of the transmission over the wireless link. And then it's very simple to listen to everything. So uh, that is that is really a problem. Um, uh, so you could do this, you, but it's the design decision here was, well, we want to have a system that is something similar to an ISDN system, no encryption, you trust the network, but now we at least have to check if someone will pay for the services. For classical ISDN phones, well, uh, the owner of whatever the number will pay for the services used from this number. And you can assume, okay, if someone uses a number, these are the phones in a certain house, a certain building, but not with mobile phones. So that was the whole idea. So there was no advanced encryption. So there's no advanced authentication of the network. So this is why we can fake these things. And as fully right, the encryption is only between MS and the BSS. So either the base transceiver station or the base station controller performs the decryption and the encryption. So this depends a bit also on the vendor where they do this. But it's not encrypted inside the network because the network cannot handle encryption. I mean, your classical legacy phone cannot decrypt anything, especially if there's still an analog phone. I don't know if there are still analog phones somewhere, but you could at least use some analog phones. So and these are exactly the reasons for this decision. So uh, no one wanted to make the system more complex than necessary because encryption decryption also means computing power, using energy from the battery, uh, reducing lifetime. So it's not only because of any secret service and police and whatever, because to be honest, uh, you don't need uh, the wireless interface to listen to conversations. All the network operators have to provide, that's mandatory, uh, have to provide the interface for law enforcement. So if you are a network operator, so if you operate a public network, then you have to provide this interface. So this is why uh, police, etc., they don't need uh, these special whatever decryption capabilities for the communication. It's different if you have end-to-end -end encryption. Then hmm, 
you cannot listen to the conversations. Okay, so it's kind of a rather simple authentication, but it's okay. I mean, it's okay, so it's not that simple to uh, whatever, listen to the conversation. You can do many other things in general with phone and mobile or fixed phone systems. And the last time you had a question about caller ID spoofing. Uh, that's something uh, you can do for fixed and for mobile phones. What does it mean? There are two things you can fake. One thing that's not caller ID spoofing, that's what I mentioned the last time, is that you have your mobile phone and there's the SIM integrated and you dial a certain number, whatever, a certain number, that's the number you dial and the SIM inside your mobile phone can map this number to whatever other number. And then the call is forwarded to this other number and you will not even notice it. That can be done. Uh, that, uh, so you can reprogram your SIM that the SIM actually grabs the call and redirects the call. So that's one thing you can do. Caller ID spoofing is something different. That's basically you have your, your phone. This might be a mobile phone or a fixed phone so that doesn't matter and this phone suddenly uh, shows whatever the FBI calls or the police calls the police will never call you with 110 or 112 or 911 or whatever doesn't matter so uh, the point is that the number you dial and the number that is displayed, these might be two different numbers. So if you call someone, then usually the number is given to you by a system inside a mobile switching system, or let's say in general, the network. And then this is a so-called network provided number. And that's the number used for routing your call through the network. So uh, you have a certain number. Well, at least that's the, the source address of your of the call. And this source address is usually not displayed on your mobile phone or on your fixed phone. Because the network says, well, it's why should I forward this number? So uh, here I need it internally, this number. So that's uh, the caller, the caller ID. Um, but that's it. So uh, there are, for example, police and other authorities that will really, they can read the so-called network provided number. That's your real phone number. In addition, some systems allow to set a user provided number so that you can actually have additionally a number so-called uh, user provided id what is this used for well think of a company a company has a certain telephone number and but many employees and now someone is talking to you and in your display, it's a good idea to show the single whatever number for the company, for the call center, for example, and not the phone number of this very specific phone used by the person talking to you. So that in your display, you will see, let's say, a certain number. Now, let's make it short. For our university, the exchange would be, let's, well, the exchange is in Berlin, something like this. And that could be, for example, if you want to do this, the number that is displayed. That's one way of doing it. Then in case you call back, you will reach this, the call center or this exchange, and then they will forward you to whoever is available 
responsible or whatever for a certain issue. And so forwarding the phone number of this very employee is not always useful because maybe the person is sick or on vacation or whatever. So there are good idea, well, good usage scenarios for this. So now caller ID spoofing, what they can do is, first of all, it's completely illegal in Germany. So it's illegal, not in all countries, but at least in Germany, it's illegal. And uh, you cannot do this in a legal fashion. Because in Germany, it's quite clear that for you, it's only allowed to use a phone number out of the set of numbers that are assigned to you. So a company is allowed to use a number out of this set the company has. So for example, you could use this number uh, and say, okay, this is one of the numbers assigned to me and I can provide this as a user provided identification. But what can you do? Not legal, but you can do with voice over IP services. So you, today you don't need any special hardware anymore. Um, by using voice over IP services, they can fake this user provided idea. So on your phone, you enable the display of the caller ID so that you see who is calling you. The problem is this display will not show the real phone number of the caller, but this probably faked user provided ID. So uh, this company, once more, this is illegal, uh, illegally uses whatever number that might look familiar to you, like a call center number from the police, something like this. You look on your display and you see, okay, uh, this is uh, the number of the police and then you will react accordingly and this is done for phishing, for example. If you simply call this number, you would end up at a different party, well, at the call center of the police, for example, and they don't know anything uh, for this. So the point is that um, with the voice over IP systems and the support by not that trustworthy operators, you can do these things. And uh, the point is, uh, it also depends on the systems. If they check here, if this user provided ID fits to the network provided ID. So if this call really originates from a network, technically spoken, originates from a network that fits to this user provided ID. And in some countries and for some hardware, they use even databases, databases where they say, we do not trust the user provided ID. We only trust our database and based on the technical number used inside the system, they map this to this user, whatever user provided ID. So that in some regions you only see, okay, this is a call from a certain region or something like that. If they know in the database only the region for this number. So usually once again, the technical phone number, this network provided ID is not forwarded to the person called, but the user provided ID. So there's a separation. And if you now spoof this ID, so you use an ID of the FBI or the police or whatever, you can simply fake an account. So that is, uh, that is the idea. But this works only, first of all, it's illegal, so you have to break a law. And second, uh, only if there's no filtering, no screening inside the network. So this is also technology that tries to stop this, uh, that there's screening inside the network that checks if this user provided ID belongs to the number range of numbers assigned to a certain caller. So in Germany, at least, well, you can do this for, let's say, maximum half a day, then someone will report this to the federal agency, Bundesnetzagentur, and they will simply shut off the numbers for uh, of the provider doing this. So, um, so usually it's done in the context of voice over IP with, let's say, classical ISDN systems. You cannot do this.
because you have this number screening, etc. But with voice over IP uh, systems, you can do more things that uh, some operators even allow using a web interface you to set a certain ID, so to set a name or whatever, and then uh, they try to forward this name as user provided ID. And if no one performs the screening, you can at least fake certain accounts. Well, illegal, but it can can be done. So there are different uh, uh, ways of doing this, but usually in Germany only for a very short time. So the problem is way bigger uh, in the US or in uh, Canada, depending on the technology used there. So call ID spoofing is always creating a kind of a fake caller ID and depending on the system on some systems it's displayed on some it's not and especially not for the police they will see the real phone number but then they will only see okay this originates from a not that trustworthy network operator and then it's up to the Bundesnetzagentur to shut down this operator which usually will be done and they've done it in history several times so they actually they shut down uh, several number ranges because they offered well, certain services over these numbers, the government doesn't want to have. <laughs> so uh, that's the idea behind this. So spammers, exactly, they can use this. Uh, and so blocking the spammers, that's sometimes difficult because uh, based on what? Hmm, based on a certain number, number ranges. So the only thing is uh, you can then uh, actually look up the displayed IDs and you can uh, write to the Bundesnetzagentur if this is really a problem. Okay, but this is basically because uh, the technical number and the number displayed can be two completely different things for good reasons, but also for, well, as you see, not that good reasons. Okay, some more security issues especially for GSM. Some more security questions. I will come back to security then when we can uh, go to a way stronger system when it comes to encryption, the Tetra system. Okay. Then uh, after this security, I went through many different data services, data services offered in the classical GSM scheme, switched circuit switching and packet switching. And you see, especially with packet switching, the data rates are quite high. And this is the, one of the classical data rates offered in GPRS. That's 50 kilobit per second. Not really that high compared to today's uh, data rates, but that was the start more or less of the success for the mobile networks when it comes to internet communication. So higher data rates, but still staying with the classical GSM system, classical system using this TDMA slot structure, but now adding new components. And this is basically also the end of everything about GSM that should, well, introduce you to the architecture, the basic architecture of mobile phone systems and some of the ideas. And this is also why you find now many questions related to the whole GSM system, because you should be able now to answer these systems. We will not go through all the questions and all the details unless you have some very detailed questions and you want to ask me something, please go ahead. So we will go through just to remind you of the main components, the main ideas, technologies used. And so if you now look back the whole GSM system and think of the basic idea of multiplexing. So where do we use multiplexing on which layers? And do not only think of physical layers and medium access, but also many, many different other layers. So there are different points in the GSM architecture and GSM where you use multiplexing and for what reasons. 
So these are the classical questions you might also ask in exams. So to see if you understood how you use where multiplexing for which purpose. So any ideas? Multiplexing. Quite general. Just write whatever you think about multiplexing. TDMA, FDMA. So these are the basic schemes. Right answer. TDMA, FDMA between the mobile station and the base transceiver station. So this is exactly what creates the channels, the frequency multiplexing, the FDMA. So FDMA to create the channels, F, F frequency division duplex to create uplinks and downlinks organized by some authorities, Bundesnetzagentur, for example, in Germany. And then you have different operators distributing the channels over the cells. So you place the cells certain, at a certain distance apart, depending on the topology, the traffic load, buildings, whatever it is. And you have to make sure for these systems that the neighboring cells do not use the same frequencies, the same channels. So this is why you need the frequency multiplexing, space division multiplexing, uh, then to repeat channels, the same frequencies, if they are a bit further apart, so non-overlapping, so not that much interference. And at the heart of GSM, you use TDMA. TDMA, remember, what do you use TDMA for? It's separation of users, separation of control and user data. And this is where we have our time slots, the different time slots for the so-called bursts. So that is the data that fits into the time slots. We separate the users by different time slots or even within a time slot, we can have two day traffic channels, for example, two voice calls. So you see, you have different multiplexing schemes, all the classical ones, space, time and frequency division used in GSM, used by different entities for different purposes. So please do have a look into this again that you understand where do we use multiplexing, how do we use it, what is the purpose for all this. Okay, then we have synchronization. Synchronization is quite important. Why? And who is responsible? And uh, how do we achieve synchronization? What, what does it mean, synchronization? Why do we need this? Now rather look at the, well, frames and what is done there. So terminals listen to the medium, receive signals, it's all broadcast, and then you synchronize. That's correct. So the base station, exactly the base stations, they have to create the frame structure. So because they control basically the cell and they create the frames and the frames, they contain so-called broadcast channels. And within the broadcast channels, the mobile stations can learn a lot. So what cell is this, what operator, country, etc. all these things, but also a clock. So this is where they can synchronize. So they have to synchronize to the frame structure. After switching on the device, the device has to synchronize. Otherwise, the device knows nothing about frames. So you have to synchronize that you know, this is my channel. So you're scanning through different channels. You're looking for a broadcast channel. If you find a broadcast channel with certain bit patterns where you recognize, ah, this is this broadcast channel, you learn a lot more about the structure, the timing, the frames, and then you know, for example, where the random access channel is, because you are not allowed simply to access the medium. This is what we learn in the context of wireless LANs, not here. So you're not allowed to access the medium. So you have to learn where the time slots are in which you're allowed to access the medium. So this is where you need synchronization. But you learn a lot more. Knowing the frame structure also helps you to synchronize 
to single slots for data transmission. You have to stay in sync, so you have to stay synchronized all the time, otherwise the slots will overlap. Overlapping, that means you will destroy the neighboring traffic. That's not a good idea. So this is why you always have to try to synchronize your data burst so that it reaches the base station within your time slot. And we learned in this context something about guard spaces, about time advanced fields, so that we send the data in advance so that it reaches the base station in your time slot. And then the guard spaces, and they can handle a bit of, you know, multipath and reflections and uh, these things, so that you do not have this overlap. The overlap might happen, so yes, you, it could be the case that you destroy some other data, but the system tries to avoid this. And this also means that you have inside your burst that you receive, you have certain bit patterns that help you to synchronize again. Certain training symbols so you can really fine tune your device to the time slot. That is the idea. Okay, then a very general question is, well, we saw from the 90s to, well, over the last 30 years, more and more this shift from voice to internet style traffic. Many people do not even know that you can call someone with a mobile phone, so they only use messaging, voice or text or emojis or whatever. So you saw this shift from voice only to internet style traffic. And how was this reflected in the GSM system? It started as a more or less voice or almost voice only system with a, a bit of data possible, but not really geared towards data traffic. GPRS. GPRS, that was the big step. So there was some intermediate step, the HSCSD, uh, I will come back to this in a minute, but the GPRS and exactly transmission of IP packets. So you saw with the introduction of GPRS that IP technology is now suddenly used. So for example, on this slide, uh, you see that here X25 is one of the protocols. Never talked about this, but you see also the IP protocol. Suddenly, uh -huh, from your mobile station across all this our mobile infrastructure, and then you forward this to other routers. So basically, you have the routing infrastructure, exactly the infrastructure you know from the internet. Routers forwarding IP packets. Yes, we have many, many more layers here so but these are the specific layers used for the mobile network because it is different oh yes and that's a funny thing we again have ip down here but that's not the ip used for your ip packets so you have your applications use your tcp udp then the ip the internet protocol this is your layer three that's the layer three you use uh, to communicate across the internet and then we have these radio specific layers and the network specific things underneath and because you have to forward the traffic so gprs was then this kind of breakthrough uh, towards more this internet style traffic and internet style traffic that means that uh, we have more and more this bursty traffic bursty so you click on something, you download a lot of data, and then silence again for several seconds. And then again, you download something. So very bursty. So a lot of data for a few seconds, and then no data at all. So this is what you see today, that all the networks, the mobile networks, are more and more tuned towards this internet style traffic. This is why we have the IP protocol inside, we have the routers inside. Uh, but GPRS was a system with new infrastructure. Okay, I answered this. Well, the routers, exactly. But um, not for HSCSD. So HSCSD is a system, well, that was somehow in between. So what was this again? And only very few operators offered this. Why? What is 
HSCSD good for? So high speed circuit switch data. And what are the problems? WAP, um, WAP wireless application protocol, something uh, I covered many years ago also in this lecture, not that uh, often used uh, anymore, it's still available in mobile phones, wireless application protocols, that was a kind of a lightweight um, web protocol suite. Um, but the HSCSD used multiple time slots, right, as your answer, um, and so you could have higher data rates, even a guaranteed data rates. Well, same guarantees as the normal voice calls. So that is reliable as long as you have the resources in your cell. So HSCSD is basically a software update and it bundles time slots if they are available. So if the cell is crowded, well, you will not have more time slots permanently available. GPRS picks time slots as soon as they're available. And you're right, for GPRS, you pay for data and not for time. For HSCSD, it's like a phone call, circuit switch, you pay as soon as you set up the connection. And you have to pay a lot if you transmit something or not. So HSCSD was a good idea for video conferencing where you need higher data rates all the time. So, and, re, uh, and with a certain reliability. GPRS, well, will not really guarantee you much. You saw the figures, the delays and everything. So GPRS is nothing for interactive communication. So try to have a video conference using GPRS. That's well, rather a nightmare. With HSCSD, as soon as you have the resources, it works pretty well but only very few operators offered this. There was no real business model. I mean, still the quality was not that good and the networks were quite crowded. So if you try to perform a handover for HSCSD, this means you have to look for, at least for something like four time slots now, not a single time slot, but four time slots. So there must be four empty time slots in the next cell. And depending on the load, maybe this is not possible to use and then the communication will break or whatever. So uh, it was not really that good kind of service. GPRS, well, you don't expect too much for cheap from GPRS, but uh, at least if there's some slot available, you can use it. So, but not really for high performance, inter especially not for interactive video. So HSCSD was just an intermediate step and uh, here in Germany I'm aware that E plus at that time offered it. I'm not aware if the others really uh, offer it uh, broad range. So, okay, very few operators. So looking back, it says, ah, okay, mm -hmm. not high data rates and higher delays, but the main problems, delays in GSM systems for packet data traffic, we have similar problems still today. Not the high, de not that high for the delays, but still delays. So think of the GSM system. So what are reasons for delays if it comes to packet data? You saw the numbers for GPRS. It can be quite high in the second range. So in GSM packet data, if you look at circuit switched, if you look at packet switched, now assume you want to transmit your IP packet over a circuit switched or over a packet switched in GSM. What are reasons for delays? Now why do we have delays if we just want to transmit an IP packet, for example, using circuit switched or using packet switched? High load, if there's a high load in the cell, yes, then it delays. But where do the delays come from? It's different if you use circuit switching or if you use packet switching. So as you saw, the fax transmission in the very old GSM system used circuit switching. It works. You can transmit data. But where does the delay come from in circuit switching and where does it come from in packet switching? 
These are basically the fundamental differences between circuit switching and packet switching. And what do you have to do for circuit switching first? Connection setup, exactly. So connection setup is the problem for circuit switching. So if the load is high, it's difficult to set up the connection. But as soon as you have a connection, there's almost, well, almost no delay. The only delay is the coding delay between your mobile station and the network, the base station, because of forward error correction, but no real additional delay. For packet switching, you have a problem. Each time you want to transmit a packet, you have to fight for channel access. For circuit switching, you have to fight once. If you're the winner and you have a channel, then you can simply use it, no further delay. But for packet switching, if the load is high, well, bad luck many, many times, and then, okay, a part of the packet gets through or a whole packet gets through, and then you again have to fight for channel access. So the problem with packet switching under high load conditions is that it's very difficult to, ac to access the channel. In packet switching, it's called the packet random access channel and for certain uh, circuit switching it's called the random access channel for both channels well you have to fight for but for circuit switching only once and then you have the channel for packet switching each time so uh, for UMTS we will see they both they came together and UMTS only has a single random access channel for packet data, circuit switch data. But this is for GSM and that's, these are the reasons for packet switching, why you have a very high delay, because uh, depending on the load, that's a problem. And that, the next question exactly states this, high delay, low reliability, but why was GPS yet a breakthrough in the GSM world? So with GPRS, we could finally do something we could not do before. What is the, there's a certain keyword for this. Higher capacity, if we use edge, yes, this, that has something to do with the modulation. We could use edge also for other modulation, but yes. But also with the pure GPRS, we had a big advantage that you use every day. So the real breakthrough here was what we call always on. Today, your smartphone, mobile phone is always on. So it's always, uh, well, attached to the network. It can always send something, receive something. You cannot do this with circuit switching because with circuit switching, you have to pay per minute usually. And with this always on, that means you send something on demand as soon as you have something. Well, it might take a while. You have to fight for this random access channel. But this was the moment when your phone could be always on. So you could always receive emails. You could always send something. And you pay only per byte or whatever your uh, subscription says. So before that, it was difficult, for example, to use emails to use the system all the time because you had to tell the phone now set up the connection because you knew okay now I have to pay for it now download and then tear down the connection again so with GPRS you could simply say uh, say okay I receive the email as soon as there is an email because you're always on so your mobile phone today is never off so it's always somehow attached to the network, can always send something. And that's the big difference. With GPRS, very low data rate, high delay. So this has changed. So uh, that was the idea. Okay. So that was basically the breakthrough that we are now always on. The next question is once again, a kind of a question that covers many different aspects. 
So if you look at GSM, what are the limitations of GSM cells in terms of diameter, capacity, and now looking at traditional GSM, HSCSD, GPRS, and how can you increase the capacity? So what limits the capacity of a cell? And there are many answers possible. What are limitations in terms of diameter, capacity, data rates, voice calls? So we have different types of limitations. The number of channels. The number of, of, of channels is indeed cell diameter up to uh, 70 kilometers, 35 kilometers away from the uh, base stations. And so the number of channels uh, limit the capacity because, you know, number of channel depends on the spectrum you have for the technology. So some whatever authority the government assigns you a certain part of the spectrum, then you can have certain number of channels. Within the channels, you can have a certain number of slots and then Per cell, you have something like three, four, five channels. Per channel, you have eight slots. So five times eight, that means 40 voice calls with a full rate traffic channel, something like this. So that's just rough numbers. You can increase the capacity, indeed, using new modulation schemes like Edge. So Edge can increase uh, this. We haven't covered... Uh, the edge and some of the new technologies yet but indeed using different modulation schemes you can have higher data rates and so uh, that's true and uh, so that's one way of increasing then quite obviously assigning more spectrum that's something more spectrum more capacity that's something uh, you can do so there are many answers possible. Limitations, especially of packet services, well, that's something special you might not know, that depending on the load, I told you this several times, uh, usually the packet service, GPRS, well, has to look for empty slots to avoid starvation of, for example, TCP connections using GPRS. The operators assign at least a certain number of slots to GPRS. So it depends on the uh, traffic load, what the capacity in terms of GPRS is. We also saw coding schemes. Coding was something uh, special. Coding schemes here in this table. So what determines the coding scheme and you see depending on this coding scheme whoa you can have really different data rates using the same number of slots in a single slot you see you can have something like 21.4 kilobit per second that's quite a lot compared to only 13 point something with this coding scheme but what determines the coding schemes and this is a very general issue if you can transmit more or less data. So the coding, the coding depends in the end on interference. So if you have high interference, you need more redundancy in your data. So if the interference is high, you need a lot of redundancy that lowers the user data rates. If there's low interference, a very qualitatively good connection, you need less redundancy. And the last time I told you, well, uh, you can have user data or you could have something like roughly 23 kilobit per second if you use a single slot but that means no redundancy check summing whatever and you see with the coding scheme here you come pretty close to this with a 21.4 kilobit per second 
And if you're able to use all eight slots, this is a classical GPRS, no new modulation. This is not edge. You can at least reach something like 170, something like this kilobit per second. So, which is okay. Not new modulation, but still pretty low. But remember, in many areas, you do not have three, four, five G systems. We'll come to this. Okay. And then another cluster of question you should be able to answer is handover, everything related to handover. So reasons for handovers, what are the steps? So we don't have to go through the details, what types of handover can occur. We saw different ways of doing this uh, handovers. Then think again, we touched this already, uh, which resources we have to allocate during handover. So if we use HSCSD, if we use GPRS, and what about quality of service guarantees? So if you want to guarantee something. So think once more about handover. Look this, uh, look up this uh, again in the slides. You do not have to know the single steps. This is just here to uh, dig into this once more, but you should know in the end, so why doing handover is quite clear that who is doing the handover in GSM? Does anyone know who triggers the handover? Who is responsible for the handover? The base stations. So the base stations, the base station controller, exactly so Together, the base station, base station controller, these are the entities in the system that are responsible. So if you look at this slide once more, you see that, and that's quite important, the mobile station itself only sends reports. So these are the so-called measurement reports. So the mobile station only tells, oh, right now I receive these three base stations with certain signal strength. And then the base station will forward the measurement results, in this case, to the base station controller. And here you do the handover decision. This is, uh, this is quite important. So you could also think of mobile systems where the mobile station actually performs the handover and tells, well, I will go to the next station. This is what we will see when we come to wireless LANs. But here, in these cellular telecommunication systems, the mobile station only assists in the handover. So this is mobile assisted handover. The mobile station is not allowed to perform the handover on its own because the mobile station does not know if there are enough resources in the new cell. So this is why inside the network, they ask for, oh, do we have enough resources? And then we will get the answer. And if the answer is no, then the base station controller cannot simply say, now we switch over into a new cell. We have maybe have to look for yet another cell. If one cell is too crowded, then we have to go to another cell. So. If you look at these questions of handover, always think the mobile station can only assist in the handover. The handover decision is made inside the network. So the base station controller says, okay, that's absolutely, that's too weak. The signal from my antennas now go to whatever new antenna. And we saw different types of handovers. Uh, so the handover is not necessarily within the same antenna or not even within the same base station controller. So sometimes, well, you have to inform the other base station controller. That's exactly the, uh, the example I showed you on slide 48. Um, so they have to talk to each other. So it can be quite complex, even handovers that are related to different MSCs. As soon as we are in other network operators, cellular network, then we call it roaming. So roaming is then uh, we hand over to a different network. Okay, so handover, that's also kind of a uh, 
well, set of questions you should think of, reasons for handovers, uh, what types of handovers so that you at least know some typical handover types and then think of resources. What do we have to allocate for HSCSD? I talked about this already, several slots for GPRS. Well, nothing. <laughs> Either there's capacity or not, but you don't have to reserve. That's a good thing about GPRS. So you can be uh, way more mobile. And guarantees, well, no one will give you any guarantees. So uh, that's, uh, that's quite a common thing. And the handover, as I said, roaming as soon as you hand over into another network. And it's quite good if you stay within the European Union because then it's for free, this international roaming. Well, you should not call it international. It's only the European Union roaming is for free. As soon as you roam into another country, you have to pay. So the example you see in the chat from Germany to Sweden, no problem at all. This is for free. But <laughs> be alert, if you roam to Switzerland, for example, it can be quite expensive or maybe soon to the UK. I don't know. We will see. Okay, that's not that close to our borders in Germany, but Sweden, Poland, Austria, Czech Republic, etc. So it's quite common that you simply roam over to the other network because they might be stronger depending on many effects of weather, of topology and where the antennas are. And if you want, if some country really wants to cover the ocean between countries and all these things. Okay. That's, I would say, enough for uh, GSM. GSM a bit broader because it's the blueprint for the other systems and you will learn a lot of uh, similarities between uh, other systems and GSM. So the final section for today, unless you have some more GSM questions. Are there any GSM related questions? We can always come back to this, so that's no problem. Okay, if there are no more GSM questions, we'll cover LTE and have time for this and 5G and all this later. Okay, then the final section was this strange system with these strange looking devices where I told you, yes, unless you're, uh, well, working with firefighters or oil rig or police, etc., you will not really get into touch with these devices. These are special devices, a special network. So the Tetra system, Tetra trunk radio, is also a second generation system, which has its strengths in areas well, you normally don't need them uh, for classical civil use, like uh, this push to talk would be nice, like a walkie talkie, but preemption, strong encryption, etc. So here we really have a system that works anytime, no matter where you are. So walkie talkies, that's basically an very old class of communication systems so the kids use them and you can buy them for a few euros or dollars and walkie-talkie that means only uh, you push a button and you can immediately talk to someone else so there's no long call setup uh, delay you push the button and immediately the other side will receive it uh, so walkie-talkies are quite cheap things uh, toys for kids but also there are expensive ones uh, used uh, in industry and walkie talkies are important because of this feature, this push to talk. So you push a button and you can immediately talk. And that's very important if you command a group of firefighters, for example, get out of the building. So uh, don't uh, waste time for call setups, for example. Extremely fast group call, sub-second group call setup. So this might be even too long uh, for certain things. So if you want to make it extremely fast, you still have to use old analog systems, but that's a different story. So still in Tetra, it's a sub second, but sub second still may take, well, sub second, almost a second. So preemption is something. So walkie talkies, uh, well, they existed long before Tetra, but the feature of walkie talkies is extremely important. So 
if you uh, push a certain button, then you immediately connect to the other device and also in ad hoc fashion. So you do not need an infrastructure. Your mobile phones will be completely useless if there's no mobile phone network. There's no way for your mobile phone to uh, enable this, this ad hoc communication unless you have special software, you use wireless LANs, but not with the mobile phone system, the GSM or uh, system. So no direct communication. Well, we will see this with LTE. The standard in LTE knows this device to device communication. Today's smartphones, whatever, they don't know this. So push to talk, that's uh, something a nice feature for these devices. And uh, we saw some more special features for the Tetra devices. That's a classical scenario. If there's a fire somewhere, you have the firefighters or police, if there's incident somewhere inside a building and you have the car outside organizing everything. You can preempt the communication. So if two uh, or police officers talk to each other, you can stop them and give them a certain command so you can preempt other calls. This does not work with GSM, the classical GSM network or UMTS or LTE or whatever mobile phone network. So Tetra is a uh, kind of a special system, a special system with, well, very low data rates. I showed you the data rates that is not really high. If you use a single slot, um, okay. There are enhancements using different types of modulation. This depends on the interference level. So different modulations and different channels. So if you use more spectrum, yes, then you have die higher data rates. That's well known from all the systems. Then at least offering higher data rates for data service. For voice, it's not that important. So voice, uh, that voice doesn't need that. I data rates, but that's the classical use. So if you see police officers, firefighters, etc., they all use the Tetra systems. It's unclear where we'll go with Tetra, but still it's there, it's used, and everyone is looking for alternatives, replacements, future systems. So why again? Why can't we simply use normal cellular phone networks? And at, uh, maybe we can have some extras there. There's GSM Rail, for example. They also offer group calls. So why can't we use them? Why do we want to have a separate system? But maybe it's also a stupid idea. Hmm. So why can't we use very fast connection setup? That's one thing I mentioned. More robust and ad hoc. So what's quite important is this 99.9999% availability, something like this. And so that's important. Encryption is important. We use lower frequencies, right? So we operate, it's quite common to operate something around 450, so let's say 400 to 450. By the way, there's uh, a lot of discussion going on what we do with these frequencies right now. That was the old mobile phone system, the C network in Germany. So what we, uh, should we do? How should we reuse these frequencies? Because with lower frequencies, we can much easier penetrate buildings to have a good uh, coverage of basements, for example. So there are quite good reasons and at we had uh, we had the G7 summit here in Germany there were thousands of users in the Tetra network uh, of different agencies different uh, from firefighters and police and ambulance emergency services different nations and whatever and it worked there was even lightning destroying one of the base stations they replaced it overnight and without any service interruption this is something you cannot do in the classical GSM, UMTS, LTE phone networks. So you can work where there's no GSM signal. Still, we have problems in basements or parking garage, underground parking, etc. So we need something that's called a Tetra repeater. So all the new buildings, they have Tetra repeaters so that you can repeat the signal. Uh, but it's really way more robust and 
the command and control center for Tetra. Uh, it's also completely different. So you have a redundant control center, one in Berlin, and uh, there's another one. And uh, so uh, it's different also the protection of the base stations. You really protect all the single base stations run by the government. So if someone opens the door in one of the base stations, there will an alarm go off in the control center. If someone wants to enter a base station, so you can uh, recognize the face, you take a picture, you can check if someone is allowed to enter and all these things. You have uninterrupted power supply, at least for certain some hours in the beginning, two hours, now more and more for six hours. So that's different. But aren't there also reasons against such an approach? So why do some countries go a different road? UK, for example. UK uses LTE equipped smartphones for the police. Why? What are reasons for not using Tetra? It's expensive, right? Someone has to set up. It was really a tragic story. I mean, in, in Germany, many other countries had Tetra already years before Germany did. It took, I don't know, 20 years in Germany before the network was installed because there was a battle going on between the national government, so the federal government and the states who should finance it because it is a separate network. So who should set up the network? pay for the base stations, where to place the base station, who is running the network, operating, etc. So it took a long, long time before the federal government said, okay, we will set up the network. So this is operated by BDBOS. That's the uh, government agency doing this. And you can use it. So the local firefighters, ambulances can use this network. So because otherwise we'd have, uh, I don't know, a strange pattern of different networks doing this. And that's something if you allow the local governments to set out their own networks, that's something uh, you may end up like in the US, for example, uh, you have hundreds of different incompatible systems. So each sheriff can use a different whatever system. And so they're not compatible. And this was one of the big problems they had during 9-11, not to have a common system. So uh, before Tetra, the uh, police used analog radio systems, so old analog classical analog systems. It was very easy to listen to these systems operating at well-known frequencies, uh, so you could even use an old radio receiver to listen to the police communication. So now with Tetra, everything is encrypted, so it's not that easy. So um, also for Large events, as you write, yes, Tetra is quite often used as a backup emergency system. So um, I remember several events, so like whatever, Olympic Games, but also uh, World Championships in soccer where they had Tetra systems, but also if some, uh, when something happened, but also used in Afghanistan, for example, for the armed forces. Uh, so Tetra systems you use wherever you really need a robust system within hours deployed so you can use a helicopter and just deploy base stations uh, so that's feasible with uh, Tetra so it's a backup system and that also answers uh, part of the third question so what a channel trend is well if you look at all the discussions everyone knows LTE and the following standards or the enhancements of LTE will bring way higher data rates. And also the firefighters maybe want to show what's happening inside buildings to the commanders outside. And uh, so uh, the problem is that for public safety mobile networks, the approaches they take right now is how to integrate this into the new releases. So you will find certain characteristics of a Tetra network in the new releases. So release 16, 17 of uh, 3GPP has certain characteristics uh, that you might need. You will find device to device communication. You will find something like, well, push to 
talk capabilities. But still it's unclear. Maybe in the future we'll have devices that are still use Tetra as a fallback, robust voice communication, because voice is still the best thing you can do for quick commands. What else? I mean, you don't want to type commands or something like this. So for quick commands, voice is still the best. Get out of there. So uh, that's way faster than typing something uh, and requires very low data rates. But if you want to transmit uh, pictures, videos, live stream, then you need higher data rates. So if you look it up, public safety mobile networks, uh, you will find this integrated in the newer releases. So different groups discuss this, uh, the advanced, if you can enhance Tetra, but this stopped because you cannot really enhance it. There's TETS, the higher data rates, but it might be a better idea to use, for example, LTE technology at lower data rates, because then you can benefit from lower data rates. And then in addition, you could make this an LTE network that is only used by the government or by ambulances, etc. So only for emergency services. So this can be done. So that means you can benefit from the commercial of the shelf devices, or at least in parts, because it's LTE technology, but then you have to use a more ruggedized uh, devices and well, you see it's waterproof and uh, the interfaces are different, but at least you can use the same technology. The problem is if you have the specialized technology, the devices are very expensive. So you pay thousands of euros depending on what kind of device and not several hundreds of euros because they're special devices. So using current systems, there are pros and cons. So, as I said, the British police, they go a different path. They use uh, current systems, but what could be problematic if you use current UMTS, LTE, GSM systems? What can be a problem there? Think of emergencies. Police cannot talk, availability, full cells, exactly, overload. So the problem there is uh, that in emergencies, usually many people also use the mobile phone networks and try to call someone. That means you cannot directly use the commercial networks, but you need certain preemption. Yes, GSM already allows four different priorities that you have the normal user classes, zero, through nine, and then the privileged user classes, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So in case of overload, you have to kick out the users, and then uh, you, well, you still have capacity for the others. So you need certain contracts with the network operators that they do it, plus you have to equip all the base stations also with uninterrupted power supply. That's what they usually have, at least for some time. But then still you have the problem that you cannot um, really do this device to device communication. So that's that's still still a problem. That's still a problem. So uh, where we'll end up? So we don't know exactly, but if you look up uh, the net for the keywords LTE and public safety, for example, you will find the several more information how you can use, well, LTE at least as some replacement for this Tetra or the old analog systems. But in Germany, the discussion is still ongoing if we should have a separated LTE network, for example, at 450 uh, megahertz, and then the police can use this. Or if whatever the energy providers, power, gas, 
should also use these networks because in case of emergency, it might be also very important to reinstall certain pipes to whatever, uh, come back with electricity, etc., etc. So this discussion is still ongoing. So, but the trend is quite clear. Uh, the police will not stay with a simple Tetra system. So they always have, in addition, some LTE system. And that's what you also see. Uh, sometimes police officers using two devices at the same time, one for talking and then one for whatever, taking pictures, transmitting uh, data, etc. So we will see what happens there. Okay, so that was all I want to say about this second generation. I know this is phased out more and more, but you will see now when we cover the third the fourth and even the fifth generation. Oh, oh, that's exactly the infrastructure. Oh no, here they added an additional component. Ah, here this is where they do something different. And then you will understand, okay, they do it different because of uh, certain reasons. So the next time I will cover mainly UMTS, the UMTS technology. That's for uh, the next time. Uh, and some of the basic ideas there. And after UMTS, LTE will follow and you will see the material on the net as usual. Okay, are there some more questions related to second generation systems or such systems in general? So please try to understand this, the basic structures and try to be able to answer these questions that are more related to these structures, like how and why do we synchronize? How do we multiplex? What is separated by multiplexing? What do we protect by security? Rather these questions that uh, where I can see if you understood the basic ideas behind the networks not the bits and bytes or the protocols or whatever. Okay. Uh, CDMA, uh, question. Uh, CDMA in GSM. No, there's no code, code multiplexing at all in GSM. GSM is a pure TDMA, FDMA system. No code multiplexing. So CDMA technology is not used in GSM. However, there is a second generation system using CDMA. So uh, that is basically a design decision. If you go back to this slide from the very beginning, you see that inside this CDMA family, there's a system called CDMA1, enhanced CDMA 2001X. These are second generation systems or 2.5G systems using CDMA, not for the GSM we covered here. So we covered so far rather this. Tetra also belongs to this TDMA, FDMA schemes. So no CDMA here. So clear separation. The first time we use the CDMA is here in the system we cover in the next time. And that's UMTS. That's where we use CDMA technology but not in GSM. Uh, and now the, your question is, why do we have LTE here? Well, the point is in LTE, in LTE, we, as you will see, use for user separation, a mixed scheme of FDMA and TDMA. So yes, you could also say, yes, GSM uses frequency multiplexing to create the channels, but this is something that is done at the level of the network operator. So the system itself is happy to stay on a certain frequency assigned by the network operator or change the channels, but the decision of the frequency multiplexing is in the end done by the network operator. The mobile station itself has the well, the emphasis of the multiplexing is on the TDMA scheme. In LTE, we will see how the mobile station 
will use a mixture of frequency and time division. So for the transmission of data, we use both at the same time. This is why it's roughly here uh, at the border. So if I place GSM here in the family of TDMA system, this does not mean that GSM uh, uses no frequency multiplexing at all. No, is that only means that the emphasis here is on time multiplexing to separate the different uses. But as you learned, GSM also uses different channels. So in the end, all mobile phone systems use frequency division multiplexing because someone assigns certain frequencies to those systems. Here, all I want to say is that, well, the user separation is mainly done using time. And in CDMA1, the standard is called IS95, it's mainly done using codes. So that's the difference. And in UMTS, we will see user separation is done using codes and not time. But still, even in UMTS, you will find some time slots, but not for user separation. So this picture shows, okay, which multiplexing technology do we mainly use to separate different data streams? But the technologies also use other multiplexing, like frequency, always frequencies, because you have to look what is the carrier frequency for a certain technology. Okay. Some more questions. Okay. If not, then thank you all once again for participating here in the Q&A session. Then please do have a look for the next time to UMTS to 3G technology. And the week after, then we'll cover 4G and then we will go into the local area networks. So thanks a lot. And I wish you all a very nice day. Thanks and bye.